um, and Francis from Williamsburg. So um, great to see everybody. I think we've got a pretty good group. It's a little bit after 11, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, so today we're going to talk about Veggie Pest Control 101 um, and just kind of Veggie Control 101. And I, I just really want to kind of go over the basics of what you kind of need to be doing in the garden and thinking about in the garden. I've got lots of stuff that I can show you um, and hopefully answer any kind of questions that you might have. Um, and uh, so as we kind of go through this, if, if a question pops in your head, please feel free to, uh, to uh, post it there and, um, and keep your comments coming. And if I can't get to them right on time, then I'll, I'll get to it at the very end of the seminar um, where I can answer all your questions in one fell swoop. So, um, of course, this year, everybody's in the yard, everybody's in the garden. It's a great time to do that. Uh, veggies have been in extremely high demand this year. Um, and, and so we know there's a lot of people out there that maybe have planted veggies for the first time. Um, or maybe they're trying it again because they weren't successful the first time. And so we realize that and we want to make sure that, uh, uh, that you have the right tools and the tricks and all the tips that we have here at McDonald Garden Center to be successful, uh, whether it's your first year or it's your 10th year or whatever it might be. Uh, hopefully you'll learn something new here today that will help uh, kind of continue um, your success in the vegetable garden. Uh, vegetables are very, very fun to do. They're easy. They really are fairly easy. They grow pretty quickly. Lots of enjoyment for so many people. I mean, different ages. I mean, I love, my kids are loving the garden this year. Uh, just seeing a, they're starting to bloom now. Um, you know, the cucumbers with their vines are starting to twine around things and the, the squash and the um, uh, zucchinis are getting those big yellow flowers on them already. So it's a very exciting thing for, for kids and for adults and people of all ages. It's a great way of getting out in the yard and exercising uh, and being active. So I'm going to help kind of make you successful, hopefully, in your veggie quest this year. Um, so uh, again, lots of people out there that are doing them. So uh, hopefully we can help you. Um, unfortunately, there are some insects and diseases and pests issues that you will probably experience um, in your time gardening, um, especially in the vegetable garden. Um, and of course, in any kind of gardening, uh, we, we all have successful uh, ventures and we all have failures um, and that's okay. And, and so that's kind of one of my favorite things about gardening is, is learning from my, um, is learning from my failures and, and, and that's, you know, it's going to happen. And so I don't want you to get discouraged. Um, it happens to all of us. It happens to the best of us, even your garden guru here. Um, makes mistakes from time to time. I plant something on the wrong spot I shouldn't have and then I got to move it or I get some sort of disease or insect issue that, that needs to be controlled um, and it's just going to happen and so just realize that as you get into this um, that, that, that those are issues that you're going to experience and to not get frustrated and to let us help you um, and we'll talk about that as we go on. Um, we have lots of controls to help so I've got a lot of products laying around me that I'm going to show you uh, some of that hopefully will help with some of the issues that you may have. Um, so uh, that, that, that'll be helpful. Um, and then kind of my most important tip that we'll start off with is always be preventative, not curative. If, if anytime you can prevent something from occurring, um, it's much easier than trying to cure it later. Uh, curing a lot of you know diseases or major infestations of insects um, is much more difficult but if you're on top of it um, and you're doing what you can do, then you should be able to elim uh, eliminate some of those, those issues. Uh, so preventative rather than curative, you'll hear me say that probably multiple times throughout this. Um, so with that being said, uh, first and foremost, I kind of want to go through some, some of the tips and tricks of some of your general basic things that you should be doing in your vegetable garden right now. Um, and, and that's just you know the, 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 the basic simple things. If you've watched any of my videos in the past, uh, you might have seen, uh, you know, when I talk about tomato plants, about pruning them and mulching and all these different things. So I kind of want to run through that list because that is one of the best ways to be preventative um, in your vegetable gardening experience is, is to do some of these primary care, you know, techniques that really will help you um, be successful in your garden um, and, and kind of prevent some of those disease and insect issues that may occur. Uh, now, nothing's 100 percent, but it's a good start. And that's where I want to start off with. Um, so let's talk about watering real quick. Um, you know, we've had a lot of rain in the area. 
Um, and so during rainy periods, some diseases can occur. Um, but let's talk about watering because I think a lot of people, uh, if they have a bigger garden, might um, use overhead watering. And that is one thing that we definitely don't want to recommend. Uh, we always want to water at the root system. Um, so we always want to water at the base of the plant. And we want to typically give each plant about an inch of water a week. Now that's kind of difficult to manage. Um, when I talk about lawns, pretty easy. You can turn the sprinkler on. You can measure how uh, long it takes to fill up an inch of water. Um, and that's pretty easy to manage. It's a little bit harder when you're watering the garden. Um, one of my favorite things is to grow tomatoes. Um, I think probably a lot of us love tomatoes. Um, and if you're growing tomatoes, tomatoes are one of the best signs because uh, they're kind of start to wilt pretty early. Um, and they're one of the first signs. And I let my tomatoes go to a little bit of that kind of sagging wilt where it looks like it's a little dry um, and it needs a little perk up. And that's when I water the whole vegetable garden. Um, and then the best way to water, like I said, is, is at the root system. And I love this watering wand. Um, these are great tools. Um, it's kind of a necessary tool, I think, for every gardener to have. Um, it's so easy to use. It just attaches to the hose. It's got an on and off valve. Um, so it's real easy to control the water and keep it off the leaves. That's probably the most important thing is to keep it off the leaves. It's got this nice shower head on it. So you get a nice even flow of water. We don't have a lot of rushing. We don't have a lot of spreading of water all over the garden. Um, and you can get it right to the source and it will save your back a little bit too because you can just hold it there. Even on some of your bigger plants, you can just take it and drop it on the ground and just lay it right next to the plant and it can just sit there and have a nice flush of water. You can control the volume of water with the on and off valve. So you can control that kind of right there. Um, so this is a great tool. I definitely recommend every gardener have one of these. It's my favorite thing. If you ever come into our garden center and you see us watering, guess what we're using? We're using one of these. So if, we, if we've been using these for probably over 50 years, you should get one for your garden. It's the best tool really out there uh, for watering. It really, really does help. So I don't recommend sprinklers, of course, um, because you're gonna get the leaves wet. And when leaves get wet, they can spread disease. Um, and that's where funguses and mildews and all those things uh, begin to form on your leaves is because the leaves stay moist and especially at night. So we want to water in the morning, not in the evening. Dampness and darkness cause fungus. And so that's what we want to avoid um, is watering the leaves and um, watering um, at night. So we always want to water in the morning. So if your tomatoes are starting to kind of wilt a little bit at five, six, seven o'clock at night, don't worry about it. Usually they're going to make it through the night unless it's some severe wilt that maybe started in the morning and you just didn't realize it until you know you got home from work or you just missed it um, and you really are worried and give them a little bit of water before the nightfall if that makes you feel a little bit better. But, um, but definitely dampness and darkness cause fungus and breed disease and that's what we don't want to encourage. So keep your leaves dry as much as you possibly can. Of course there's rain and there's wind um, and those spread diseases as well and, and, uh, and blights and all these different things that we'll get into a little bit later. Um, but the best thing that you can do for preventative purposes is to water your root systems and don't water your leaves. None of your plants are going to take in water through its leaves. It's always going to take in water through its root system. Um, so th those are kind of some helpful techniques on watering. Uh, don't feed your plants too heavily. Um, so uh, when we talk about fertilizers, I mean, some of my favorite ones are made by Espoma. Uh, Garden Tone is a great one. We've got Tomato Tone. Um, but these are nice and light. They don't have, they're not real heavy in nitrogen, and that's one thing that I think a lot of people uh, make a mistake on is they'll use like a 10-10-10 or a 20-20-20, which is pretty high in nitrogen. I mean, your garden tones are going to be like a 3-4-4. Uh, tomato tones are going to be right about the same. Um, so they're nice and safe and light and pretty fail-safe. Um, so you're not going to make, uh, you're not going to have any issues um, if you accidentally drop too much on there. Um, but early in the season, especially right now when we're experiencing cool weather, lots of rain, um, your plants are going to want to grow. And if you give it too much nitrogen, it's going to force too much growth. And plants that uh, grow are growing too quickly can cause added stress to the plant um, and, and cause a weaker structure and therefore disease and insects um, kind of come and attack. They know when a plant is weak and that's what, the, the, that's what they're going to attack. So don't overfeed your plants either. Um, so a lot of people, you know, want to see more growth. And right now, you know, it's been cool. And so the soil temperature isn't warm enough to really make your plants grow. I mean, a lot of us are growing peppers. Peppers, my peppers have maybe grown a couple inches. Um, they're just sitting there and that's okay. Um, just, they're just waiting for warmer weather. Tomatoes are growing pretty quickly. Squash and zucchini is growing pretty quickly. Cucumbers are kind of slower. Um, but that, that's kind of normal. Our soil temperature just isn't that hot. Um, so if anybody's growing lettuces or cabbages or any of those other cool crops, those cool season crops, you're probably seeing a great success. Um, even though we're about to warm up, 
um, and those aren't going to last much longer in this area. Um, but, uh, but if you are growing some cooler season crops, you're probably seeing a great um, extended season for those. For us that have planted our tomatoes and veggies and our summer crops, um, you know, just be patient and don't try and force it too much. Um, you know, watch your weather forecast. Uh, looks like we're going to remain cool for a while. So, uh, so keep that kind of under control. And you probably won't need to water as heavily either right now. We've had a lot of rain, so we don't need to water as heavily when we get a lot of rain. I love having a rain gauge nearby. Um, it tells you kind of how much rain we've had. You can also check your weather reports and just see how much rain we got in the area. Uh, but a rain gauge will tell you right there in your garden how much water you're getting. Um, and so, and then of course we want to water our plants when they're dry and we want to water deep and less often. I did forget to mention that when I talked about watering. So when we water our vegetable gardens, I mean, if, if you've had your plants in the ground for three or four weeks now, um, then you want to water, you know, once or twice a week, very deep, less often. So, um, hopefully that helps you with, with your watering. And then again, an inch of water is, is like I said, kind of tricky to, to measure but just water to the point where hopefully your plants don't wilt for another three or four days. And the idea is there is as those, that soil is drying out, those roots are searching for water and that's how you get a good deep root system. Um, so, and then just don't fertilize as heavily either right now. Uh, when the plants begin to bloom and produce fruit um, and they're getting bigger, then you definitely are gonna need a little bit more fertilizer. And that's where with like a garden tone, an organic uh, fertilizer, uh, plant food, I might recommend doing every five to six weeks. Um, just to keep up with it. But right now you can probably take it a little bit easy, let those plants kind of acclimate uh, and kind of get their own start, um, especially if you used uh, my favorite Biotone starter fertilizer. If you use this to plant your veggies with, which is an awesome, awesome thing to do, um, then you've got those mycorrhizae and beneficial bacteria in there already working on that symbiotic relationship um, and, and creating a great root system. And so this is gonna be good for a little while. So let that kind of work through. Once we start to warm up, you're gonna see those veggies really grow, um, and then you're really gonna to need to kind of feed them to, to keep them going. Um, so then mulch. Um, I definitely recommend mulch. Weeds are a major issue in the vegetable garden. They breed disease, they breed fungus, they breed insects. I mean, they're just bad for the vegetable garden. Not only are they unsightly and a nuisance to you, um, but they also are not good for the plants. When we have a lot of moisture in the air, when we get really humid, and we've got weeds growing underneath our plants, um, then, then that's gonna kind of create that human environment. There's not gonna, it's not gonna allow good airflow through your plants. So we definitely are gonna wanna keep weeding our gardens, keep the weeds out, that'll help with disease and insect issues in the future. Um, and, then all, and so if you've got an issue and it's maybe getting out of control and you wanna be a little bit more careful um, and you don't feel, feel like your hand pulling is capturing enough and getting into it enough, I do carry this great product, Natural Guard Non-Selective Weed Killer. It's a completely organic, safe way of killing weeds. Um, now, this will kill whatever it touches, so you gotta be careful around some of your plants. Um, and we'll talk about pruning here in a minute, and that might help you um, as we take our, our bottom leaves off. and might open up some free, some free space. But basically, anything that this gets sprayed on the leaves, it should kill. And it kills it pretty quickly, too. Uh, so it's a burning agent. It's not gonna kill it all the way to the root system perfectly 100% the first time. Um, but it is a great way of kind of helping you maintain some of that, that, that weed issues that you might be having in your gardens. Um, so this is a great organic, safe way of doing it. You can also use corn gluten as a, um, as a, a pre-emergent, a way of preventing the weed seeds from germinating. Uh, but hopefully you don't have a lot of weed issues. I mean, if you're doing container gardening, um, if you're growing your vegetables and your, your herbs and stuff like that in a container, then you're probably not having major weed issues and, and raised beds. That's why we do it. But then if you're doing it in the garden or even on a raised bed, I do recommend mulching. Mulching really, really helps many, many levels. Um, so one mulching I think makes the garden look a little bit better. Um, it also prevents the soil when we have heavy rains from splashing on those bottom leaves, which can breed disease and fungus issues. Um, and it also keeps your soil warm in the cooler times and then cool in the hotter times. So it evens out your soil temperature which is really, really important. So we don't have fluctuations in temperatures. I mean, if, if uh, a lot of us are going through some crazy weather patterns, and so um, if you have a lot of moisture, a lot of dry periods, um, hot days, then cool days. Uh, so this is gonna, mulching is gonna help really kind of maintain uh, your, your moisture level in your soil and also the, uh, the, the temperature range uh, that your soil is in. So that's really, really important to know. Um, that, that mulching really does help and it's a huge benefit. Keeps weeds out, 
keeps your temperature even, keeps your moisture even, and it looks better and keeps the soil from splashing. And if you're growing squash and zucchini just sprawling, um, or even some people grow cucumbers, uh, watermelons, pumpkins, any of those, um, the mulch is going to keep those fruits as they set off the soil, uh, which will help them from rotting and keep them nice and fresh for you. Um, so mulching has a lot of benefits. I definitely, definitely recommend it for your vegetable gardens. Uh, another good technique is to inspect your garden. Uh, so and inspect your garden every, you know, every week I usually say get out there, um, enjoy some time outside. It's a gorgeous day today. We've got gorgeous weather here um, right now. So it's a great time to go out there. Check it out. See what's going on. Check the undersides of your leaves. Look for insects. Look, look for diseases. Um, you know, and, and then look for you know, any kind of stress. Uh, there's lots of different things that you might see um, that might concern you. Um, and then, of course, you can always contact us if you have any issues um, uh, that you're seeing in your garden. But it's a great time to just kind of get out there, spend some time in the morning, in the afternoon, and we're getting closer and closer to kind of actually being able to pick some veggies. So it's a great time when you're out there picking your veggies, pull a couple weeds, inspect the undersides of your leaves, uh, inspect the lot, uh, the, all your leaves, do a little maintenance, do a little bit of cleanup, debris that maybe has been picked up, you know, from blown in from the area. Uh, that can be the harbinger of other diseases. Um, and so that will help you um, as well kind of prevent some of those things just by getting in the garden. I mean, enjoy it. Be out there. Do it two or three times a week. It's a great time to do that. Uh, really, really will help you kind of see what's happening in your garden. Um, and then also, uh, I mentioned the pruning. So I really do recommend that. Taking the bottom uh, branches, leaves off of your tomatoes, peppers, um, even some cucumbers and squash. I mean, you always have that kind of initial leaf set. You're going to start to see those turning yellow and brown naturally anyways. Now, they'll fall off. Uh, but while those leaves are there and they're yellow and they don't look real great, um, the, the plant is putting energy into those. Um, and so as that energy is going into those poor looking leaves, um, it, it's spending energy doing that. It's not putting it into what, what is healthy and what is doing well. Um, so by taking those off is very important. Of course, whenever we prune our vegetables, we always want to disinfect our pruners. That's the, another number one thing that I definitely recommend. You can use mouthwash, you can use rubbing alcohol, um, so those are great ways of, 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 of cleaning your pruners. I say clean them after every snip. Uh, I know that sounds laborious, uh, but if you're out there enjoying the day, just spend a little bit of time, get a little cup of rubbing alcohol and dip your pruners in after each snip, um, or get a little spray bottle, a little mister, and just make a clip and then just mist them down, make another clip. Uh, you, you'll get pretty good at it, you get pretty handy at it. Now some people say you can just do it for each plant. Disinfect in between each plant, and that is helpful too. Um, but do disinfect your pruners because if you're pruning one plant, uh, limbing up a tomato plant, let's say, and it has a disease that you haven't identified yet, and then all of a sudden you go and prune another one, you can spread it pretty easily that way. Uh, so disinfect your pruners. Um, so, and then of course, water, I, I mentioned the watering, uh, staking our plants. So if you haven't staked your plants, if you haven't put a cage on them yet, get to work on that. Um, as your plants get bigger, they get harder to deal with, especially if you're going to cage them. Uh, tomato cages are a very easy way of keeping your plants upright, keeping them sturdy. Uh, tomatoes are vines. Tomatoes naturally are going to want to kind of grow all over the place. And if you let them do that, um, then disease and, 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 and uh, fungus and insect issues can occur as those plants get a little bit wild and get growing on the ground. Um, and you're going to get a lot of issues there. So we want to keep our plants upright. We want to create airflow. And that's what staking our tomatoes and, um, and peppers and cucumbers and eggplant and all of those things, uh, that's what really helps those do very well. Uh, so if you haven't done that yet, you know, get some bamboo steaks, get some of our metal steaks, our hardwood steaks. Even tomato cages are, are very good for peppers and, and, and cucumbers to kind of cling on to. Um, so, so start thinking about those things. What are your plants if they need to climb on something um, or if they need to be contained in some way? How are you going to do that? We've got lots of different options here for you. Um, and then avoid damaging the roots. So, you know, that, that is another thing is there's a lot of insect and disease issues that occur at the root system of the plants. And so what we don't want to do is break a lot of, of, of um, roots when we do that. So one thing is if you haven't planted your vegetables yet, um, then when you plant your vegetables, try not to tear up the root system too bad, especially right now as those soil borne diseases and fungus issues um, are occurring right now. Try not to damage your root system. Just plant them normally. Use the Biotone uh, starter, which is a great thing to kind of help ward off any kind of disease as well as it 
you know, again, kind of forms that symbiotic relationship and continues to help it. Um, but, um, but try not to damage your root system. So if you haven't put a cage on your plants or you haven't put a stake on your plants, you don't have to stake right next to the trunk. You can stake a little bit further away and tie it to it, um, and you can put them in at angles. We can be very careful about our root system. So peppers have a very small, very top-heavy root system, um, so we got to be careful about our roots. Um, if you got mole and bowl activity, come and see us. We'll get you something to get those out of there. We've got repellents that are organic that'll get them out of there. We don't want the bowls digging up our root systems or hurting our root systems, um, and hopefully that will help as well. So we want to protect our roots as much as we possibly can. Vegetables don't have a huge root system, um, and that's why we typically are watering our gardens a little bit more when we get really, really hot. Um, so that's why we have to do that, but, but we want to protect that root system. Um, and then crop rotation. I'm going to talk about crop rotation kind of throughout this, but crop rotation is something to definitely consider. Take a minute um, and draw your garden. I mean, just draw a quick overhead kind of diagram of your garden, if, especially if you've got a larger garden. Um, because it's a great time to do that. We're kind of waiting for everything to kind of pick up and start rolling um, in our vegetable garden. So it's a great time to kind of sit down, draw your garden. And the reason I want you to do that is because I really want you to practice crop rotation as we go forward throughout the years. Because if you ever have an issue with a tomato plant um, or a pepper plant or any of these different types of vegetables that we're growing, and it's a soil-borne disease, um, you're not going to want to plant that same plant in the same spot. So you definitely want to do crop rotation. Uh, and typically it takes about two to three years to get that disease out of the soil. Um, and there's some other techniques that, that we could try, uh, but the best technique is crop rotation. So that's what I always recommend. Is, and the best way to know that is to draw it. So that next year when you go to plant your vegetable garden and you're going to plant, you can say, oh yeah, I need to, you know, I need to not plant my tomatoes here. I need to move them and plant a different crop in that location. And then we kind of go around. So I always try and segment my garden off into at least four segments so that I've got one area that maybe I can take off a year um, or plant a, a cover crop. Um, so, so those are kind of some of my tips and, tri and tricks and techniques that will hopefully help be preventative and not curative. Um, another good thing to do is as you see rain and clouds and cool weather and the temperatures, um, as you see those coming, to kind of be a little pre preventative and, and, uh, and get out there and maybe do a couple sprays. And so I want to show you a couple things that you can use. Uh, two of my favorite products for the vegetable garden are Triple Action, made by Fertilone. Awesome, awesome product. I definitely, this is one of those that you probably heard me talk about before. It's something that I definitely recommend every household having because if you don't know what the issue is, whether it's an ornamental, edible, fruit, vegetable, anything, if you don't know what the issue is, it's probably going to cure it. Um, now it does everything. It's an insecticide, fungicide, miticide. And whenever we have something that does all three things, it's never as strong as a specific one. So, um, so it's not going to be 100% effective on everything, but it is going to help um, and, and it at least get you a start. So if you're at home and you can't make it in and, and you got a bottle of triple action, you know you're safe to spray it. Um, it's a very, very good product. Kills lots of insects, the easy insects for sure. Um, and it's also a fungicide. So it's got neem oil and pyrethrum. Pyrethrum is from chrysanthemums. So it's completely safe, completely organic, um, and you can use it on anything. And so it's a great product to just kind of have around because if you don't know what the issue is, this might help at least get you started until you can get in and see us um, if it's something specific that we need to attack. The other one is a Be Safe 3-in-1 Garden Spray. So this is a really cool one too. Fairly new product. It's the only product that I've ever come across that actually says it will not kill bees. So this one can hurt bees. You know, I typically say try not to spray flowering plants if you can with triple action. Um, if, especially try not to get it on the flowers as much. Typically, you're just trying to spray the leaves to control, you know, powdery mildew or aphids or lace bug or anything like that. Um, so triple action is a good one for that. But if you want to be very, very careful, Be Safe 3-in-1 is another great uh, option for you. Very similar to triple action. It is a 3-in-1. It's an insecticide, miticide, and fungicide. Not quite as strong because it doesn't have the pyrethrin in it, which can hurt the bees. So we want to be careful with this one. But this one is a great option as well. And we carry both of these products at all of our locations, including our markets, our satellite locations around Hampton Roads. So great things to kind of pick up and just kind of have around. Um, so triple action and be safe. Uh, really, really good ways to get out there and kind of be preventative. Spray it on everything, get those leaves nice and wet with it. Um, again, you know, different <laughs> than what I was saying earlier, don't water the leaves. But this is something that, that is going to be preventative and curative, um, so, or be preventative rather than curative. Uh, give it about two or three hours to dry on there. 
um, that will help. Try and spray in the morning or in the evening. Again, I always recommend in the morning if you can, get out there early, get out there and spray so that it has time to dry throughout the day and we don't have dampness and darkness. Again, that can cause fungus. So we typically wanna spray in the morning if we can. And then why we don't spray during the middle part of the day is because a lot of these are oil-based products. So I know Be Safe has sesame oil in it. And so sesame oil, again, when we get into, you wanna be careful with these in the 90, 95 degree temperatures. We can create a mini greenhouse effect that can actually cook those leaves and burn them. So we wanna be careful. Neem oil has that same issue. So anything that's got an oil-based product um, is using that as a suffocation idea. So the idea coats the plant, suffocates the insect or disease out, uh, but that can create that mini greenhouse effect. So that's why I encourage doing it in the morning or in the evening, and morning is always better. And then also in the middle part of the day, that's when our pollinators are out, and we don't wanna hurt those. So be safe um, and, and just read the directions. So I've got lots of products here, and I will tell you multiple times, always read the directions and the labels thoroughly before you use them so you know exactly how many times to use them, when you can harvest after spraying, and all that information that I have in here, but um, I probably won't be able to spew all out uh, to keep this in, in somewhat of a confined time frame. Um, so again, triple action and be safe, kind of my favorites. So let's talk real quickly about insects and, and, and disease. So insects on, on tomatoes, eggplant, squash, zucchini, um, cucumbers, and, and peppers, there's a lot of them. Um, some of the basic ones are going to be like aphids and white fly and spider mites, kind of some of your basic insects um, that are garden pests. Um, and of course, they're pretty easy to control. Um, I, saw, I think I saw somebody ask, do we have ladybugs? We are getting them in. Uh, we do carry them here at our Independence location and our Great Neck location. Um, they have, we had a little shortage there for, for a week, but they should be in by the end of this week. Um, and ladybugs are a great natural um, um, uh, predator of a lot of these smaller insects. Um, now, a lot of these smaller insects aren't going to cause major issues in our vegetable gardens. Um, they do kind of hurt the plants. They're not obviously going to help. We want to, kept, we want to uh, take care of them, um, but what they really do that is the worst thing is they're going to spread disease. Um, so a lot of thrips can spread disease, aphids can spread disease. These, these bugs can cause issues, uh, but those are pretty easy to control. So again, I'll show you a couple products that you can use. Neem oil is a, is a very popular one, very safe. Natural Guard by Fertilome. Um, is a completely safe, organic way. Again, it's a neem oil, it's not triple action, so it's completely safe, it's gonna suffocate again. So it's again, a, a, a insecticide and a fungicide. So it's gonna coat the plant and suffocate those insect and disease issues. So neem oil is a good option. Um, and then also one of my favorite ones is spinosad soap, or spinosad. Um, so let me see if I can find that. No, we got it around here somewhere. There we go. So this is spinosad. Um, I thought I had the ready to use, but I might not have brought it. So spinosad um, also comes in a soap as well. So it just adds the insecticidal soap part of it, which I do have that. So insecticidal soap and spinosad, they actually make a ready to use that has both of those in it. Um, so that's a great option as well. But spinosad is one of my favorite organic OMRI listed uh, insecticides. It's great for cutworms, and we'll talk about a couple of these other ones in a minute, but it's a great one for worms, but it also kills lots and lots of insects. So spinosad soap is a really good one. Um, oils, the Be Safe, really good options for those basic kind of insects. So a couple other ones that'll be kind of some, some specifics that you might have dealt with in the past or you might encounter this year. Um, and again, I just want to try and get ahead of some of these things. Uh, tomato hornworms, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about those. Not a major, major, huge problem in this area. Um, they, they do cause some issues if you get them. Uh, but spinosad soap, spinosad, um, is a great option for the hornworms. Um, you can also use dipel dust or BT. So I'll show you that. This is dipel dust, and it comes in a liquid form as well. Basically, it's Bacillus thuringiensis. That is a beneficial bacteria that only kills worms. Um, so it's a little limited as to what it can do. But if you've got a major issue, especially if you're growing cabbages or, or your leafy vegetables in the fall, it's an awesome, awesome product because the cabbage moths leave those little green worms and they're a pain. Um, so this is a great option, but for the hornworm, tomato hornworm, and also for your cutworms, um, this, these are great options for you if you wanna get really, really specific. But again, that's kind of why I like that spinosad is because, uh, or spinosad is because um, it, it's a very kind of 
overall insecticide um, that will kill a lot of the worms as well. So it's a great worm killing product. And I say worms, caterpillars are what I think a lot of us think of. Uh, we're not killing earthworms, so don't worry. Um, but the, the worms in our vegetable gardens are typically caterpillars. Um, so those products really, really work very well for that. Uh, and then uh, squash bugs. So I know squash bugs, I think I've seen a couple comments over there. And I see a lot of questions coming in, and I'm going to get to all of those at the end. Um, so I'm just going to kind of run through the insect and disease portion so that we can get to all your questions. Because I, I knew this was going to be a very question-heavy topic. Um, so we'll get to those and, and we'll probably, uh, you know, hopefully get some of your answer, your, your questions answered. Um, but squash bugs are a tough one. Um, of course, they, they lay their eggs um, um, on the undersides of the leaves. And so that's kind of what I mentioned, you know, inspecting your garden and kind of keeping an eye on them. Squash bugs are a major nuisance. Um, they, they will suck the sap out of the leaves and really damage the leaves and your squash plants just begin to die. I mean, they can literally kill a plant. So squash bugs are really bad. Check the undersides of your leaves. If you can get the eggs early, you can squash them, rub them off. You know, sometimes I'll take a, a, like a butter knife and just brush them off into soapy, uh, soapy water. Um, and that kind of, kind of helps it kind of um, um, uh, kill those eggs um, or it gives you a way of disposing them. Um, some people say you can just brush them off into the ground. And then, of course, natural other insects will eat them um, as a source of food. But, um, but squash bugs are a pain. Now, one of the biggest issues, I think, is, is how do you get them all together, especially the adults. And so I've got a tip for you, a little trick that I learned a few years back. Um, take a plank, a piece of wood, a shingle, if you've got an extra shingle from your house or something, something flat and fairly good size that you can fit into your garden and lay that on the ground. Squash bugs are looking for places to hide at night. So what they'll do is they'll congregate under there. Even the nymph stage will kind of congregate under something. Now, most of those are going to stay on the undersides of the leaves, but you might get some congregating underneath your board. Um, and the hope is that you get to this before the nymphs or the, the egg stage. So you got your eggs, your nymphs, then your adult stage. Um, but if you get the adults because they're starting to come out, starting to breed, lay eggs, and the whole process is about to start, if you can get the adults early, then that'll be super helpful. So lay a piece of wood or a shingle, something flat that they'll hide under at night because they're hiding from predators. Um, they'll hide under there and then in the morning go out there and you can literally squash them if you want to be very, very organic. Or you can use something like uh, Spinosad that I mentioned earlier or Triple Action. So you can use the Triple Action or the Spinosad to help get rid of those squash bugs. Um, so you can pull up that board, you'll see them congregated under there and then you can spray them down. Um, a couple people have used diatomaceous earth and said that's worked pretty well. They're pretty, they're pretty strong insects. Um, so diatomaceous earth, you know, this is a small one. We carry bigger bags as well. But this is in a puffer tube, and you can kind of puff some of that under there. Basically what this is is like shards of glass to crawling insects. So as they crawl across it, it kind of slices them up, and it kills them over time. Um, so great for slugs and snails and stuff like that. But a um, uh, great option as well if you want to put some of that underneath the board. And hopefully when you pick up the board, they're all dead in the morning. Um, you can also prevent, uh, you can also spray some, um, some stronger products, which I will talk about here in a minute. Uh, there's lots of stronger stuff, of course, that you can use. There are traditional methods. I'm showing you lots of organic solutions. We want to be organic and as safe as we possibly can. Uh, but I will show you this as we talk about uh, squash bugs uh, right now. Broad spectrum insecticide. Is kind of like the new seven. I know you've probably heard of seven. Seven is a is a good product. There's nothing wrong with it. It's been around forever. Um, and, and from what I've heard, and this hasn't been official yet, but carbaryl is, is the main ingredient there. Um, and that is supposed to be coming off the market fairly soon. So Fertilome, of course, have take, has taken action. They're a great company, um, and and they've gone into a, a much safer product, which is bifenthrin. Um, and so this is a very you know light um, a concentrate of bifenthrin. Um, again, it is traditional, it is man-made, uh, so it's something that you might not want to use. But if we're using it for squash bugs and we're just spraying underneath that board in the morning, it's a good one. It's a great one to use around the home for, for um, um, you know, some of those water bugs and other different things um, that we might have, crickets, ants, those types of things that are getting into our home. Uh, has a great residual, lasts a fairly long time, so that's why people love this product. Uh, but you don't have to use it on your plants. You can just use it to spray underneath that board to kill those squash bugs a little bit more effectively. Uh, so a good option there as well. Um, but we do have the organic ones as well. Um, so let's talk about cucumber beetles real quick. I think cucumber beetles is another one um, that people have issues with. Um, there is, of course, go back to Spinosad. You're going to hear me use this product a lot. It's a great one. 
uh, for the, the cucumber beetles. Um, they're usually on the ground, um, as well as they'll get on the leaves as well. Um, but they're, they're kind of a problem in this area. Um, they lay their eggs in the, the plant, um, which causes major issues with the plants. So, so that, that is something that we definitely want to, to watch out for is the cucumber beetles. They kind of look, there's a striped one and there's a dotted one. And they kind of almost look like a ladybug. Um, so a lot of people, you know, might see them and say, oh, I've got ladybugs. Uh, when, act when in actuality, they're cucumber beetles and they're not, they're not good insects. Um, so we want to make sure we control those. And then cutworms are another one. Cutworms are worms. So again, we can go back to our biological, which is our dipel dust. Um, or we can go with the liquid form um, or... Of course, spinosad. Spinosad is a great worm killer. So really, really good. Again, not earthworms. We're talking about caterpillars um, that, that are the, the larva stage of other beetles or, or moths or different things like that. Um, and so they, they are eating a lot to, to, to uh, turn into the, the, the adult stage of their life. So that's what they're causing issues with in our plants. Now, cutworms are typically going to be on the bottom, on the ground. Um, right on the soil level, um, so we want to make sure we're spraying around our plants as well. Um, using diatomaceous earth is a great option. Lots and lots of solutions. And again, probably too many for me to kind of go through right now. Hopefully I can get to some specifics um, when we get to uh, your questions. Uh, but those are some of the major insect issues that we experience in this area. Uh, of course, there's lots and lots of other things that can occur. Uh, but the most important thing, again, is keeping some of them at bay so that they don't spread disease, which is the next topic. Lots and lots of diseases out there. And unfortunately, they're all very similar looking and they're all very, very difficult to identify sometimes. Um, and so what I always want to, to tell people is, is there's lots of ways to reach out to us. Um, you know, take a picture, send it to our, um, to our Facebook page, and send us an Insta, uh, a message on our Facebook page. We'll be glad to try and answer it as quickly as we possibly can. Um, and um, of course, you can always come into our garden centers. We're open 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day of the week. Um, especially here at the Independence location and our Great Neck locations. We have great experts uh, in our garden pharmacy. So if you bring in some leaves, bring it in in a little Ziploc bag to contain the disease. Um, but that, that'll help us. And if you bring it in while it's somewhat fresh too. So don't cut it and leave it in your car for six hours. Uh, bring it in as quickly as you can so that we can see it fresh off the plant. Um, and that will help us identify what that specific problem is. Unfortunately, there's a lot of diseases uh, such as bacterial wilt, southern blight, fusarium wilt, there's a lot of them out there that unfortunately are not curable. Um, so again, we want to practice all those measures I talked about before. Not watering the leaves, getting good airflow in our plants. All of those good practices will really help prevent some of these issues that may happen. Now, some of them are just going to be in the soil. Maybe you haven't done crop rotation in a few years, um, and that's unfortunate because a lot of these aren't curable. And so we're going to recommend getting rid of the plant and either starting over or, or just unfortunately sacrificing that plant for this year. Um, if that is an option, we do have, if that is something that we have to do, uh, a great option that I definitely have recommended before is, is because you can't plant in that same spot and you might not have any more space anywhere, you can of course do some tomatoes or, or peppers or cucumbers or whatever we're having problems with in a container. There's so many great container options now um, that we can put nice fresh potting soil in there. You don't have the disease in there. And then you can go ahead and plant there um, and you can still get some, some veggies this year. Um, so, so that is some of the uncontrollable diseases. And again, they're very hard to identify and very hard for me to even try to show you pictures of. They're also very similar. You can do a lot of research online. Um, Fertilome, which is one of my favorite websites. So Fertilome right here uh, is a great company. If all you have to do is just type in Fertilome into your web browser, you can type in a lot of different things into their search engine and it will tell you which products that, we, that, that they recommend, um, and we carry a majority of what they have. Um, and so Fertilone makes all, all the natural guard products, which are completely OMRI listed, very safe, organic, um, insecticides and fungicides. Uh, so a couple other things with, with the disease issues, uh, fungal leaf spots, early uh, to late blights, um, some of those are curable. And so I wanna show you a couple different things um, that I definitely recommend for those. Uh, the traditional method is broad spectrum. Uh, this is a landscape and garden fungicide. It is very, very good. If you've ever heard of Dacanel, same thing. This is chloroethanol. This is a great fungicide. It's recommended. If, you, if you're doing some research on the internet and you check out some of the, like the Clemson's or the Norfolk, uh, sorry, the NC States, all the universities, Virginia Tech, of course, um, they're going to recommend chloroethanol a lot. 
It's a very, very safe fungicide. We've been using it in our vegetable gardens for years, um, but it is man-made, it is traditional. So, of course, there's organic options, and this is a copper soap fungicide. So copper soap by Natural Garden, let's see if I can get some of that glare off of it. So copper soap um, is a great fungicide as well, and these are usually kind of equally matched, um, especially when we're talking about leaf spots um, or some of the blights. Uh, and again, better to be preventative than curative, so if we can get out there and you think you might have a little bit of signs, you, you've had it in the past, um, it might be a good option to get out there and start spraying uh, just to prevent those issues from occurring. Um, but these are great options. This is what we're always going to recommend is one of these two. Um, and so you've got an organic option, sorry, you got an organic option and you've got a, a traditional option as well. Um, but these are great products, probably the two best fungicides out there. Again, like I showed you with the B-Safe uh, or the Triple Action, uh, when we talk about oils, even just a straight horticultural oil. So I have horticultural oil here. Um, those again, we want to watch on our temperatures on when to spray, but they're going to have that suffocating effect as well. So if we're using something like Be Safe or Triple Action, um, they're great options and the neem oils and the sesame oil in there is going to coat and suffocate some of those disease um, and, and fungus issues out as well. So powdery mildew, that's probably one of the biggest ones. Um, cucumbers, uh, squash, zucchini, tomatoes, I mean, they, they can really all get it. It's watermelons, pumpkins, they can all get uh, powdery mildew. You hopefully haven't seen it yet. Um, it typically occurs when we get a little bit warmer and we're humid, but we've had a lot of overcast skies and we've had a lot of rain. Um, so so that, that is an issue there um, that, that, that you will probably see is powdery mildew. Um, again, if you're using kind of a, a consistent spraying method, um, then that will help you as well um, to, to, um, to, to cure some of those or to prevent some of those powdery mildew issues. Now, powdery mildew don't, won't typically kill your plant, um, but it can um, uh, cause some major deformations in the plants, and obviously the plant's going to be stressed, and you're not going to get as good of a fruit set. So we want to try and keep powdery mildew off as much as possible. Again, good airflow, not watering the leaves, um, and, and, and disinfecting your pruners and all those good practices that I talked about um, are, are some of the options there that will help um, kind of be preventative again with that. Um, so try that as well. Um, and then, okay, so then we've talked about, so, th so again, lots and lots of diseases out there. Uh, I know that, um, that um, you, you might experience some of those and we want you to feel comfortable coming in or, or checking in with us to see exactly what you got before you just go and rip out your plants. Now, a lot of times, if it is an uncurable disease, then we are going to recommend um, pulling out those plants and disposing of them. And in that case, don't compost them. Put them in the dumpster. Uh, get rid of them. Put them in a plastic bag. Get rid of them uh, because we don't want to continue that, that spreading of that disease. Um, so definitely, um, so definitely, kind of make sure that you are keeping some of those disease plants out. Um, of your garden if, if you ever experience anything like that. Um, so then I want to kind of go over, so those are kind of the diseases. Again, there's so many out there. There's a lot of different ones. Um, you can do some research at home. Again, if you're doing research, use uh, Fertile Loans website or uh, use some of the, the college's websites. Um, like I said, uh, 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 Virginia Tech, Clemson, um, NC State, they have great research departments. They're horticultural departments. They have to do the research. So use their research. They have good pictures now. Um, so some great uh, resources there for you to kind of look into um, instead of just typing in what's wrong with my cucumber um, and then you get some of these websites that, uh, that maybe we can't trust. But those, those websites that end in EDU are great, Fertilome, and then of course you can always reach out to us um, to help us try and identify what those are. Um, okay, so then a couple other things that I want to talk about with our vegetable plants that we might see issues with. Um, blossom end rot is probably one of the most common ones that we always get in this area. Happens on our tomatoes, happens on uh, peppers, as well as eggplant. So it can happen on a lot of different things. Uh, really can happen on many of our summer vegetable crops. Um, and typically what that is, it's actually a fungus, um, but, uh, but it's derived from, being, from our soil lacking in calcium. So we wanna make sure we keep our calcium levels up um, and, and not probably have too much potassium and magnesium in our soil. So, so um, if we ever need to do a soil test, uh, that is an option that you can do. If you're really getting into vegetable gardening, uh, you, can get, uh, you can contact your local extension agent and send a test off to Virginia Tech 
Um, you can do that in any state. So I know we got people watching all over the country. Um, you can look into your extension office and they should be able to do a complete, dialysis, uh, complete diagnostic test on your soil to get all your different levels. Typically, you're not going to need that. Calcium deficiency is what causes that black spot on the bottom of your tomatoes. You can see it right here in that picture. So this is calcium nitrate. This is one option to be able to uh, alleviate that problem. It's better to start now than wait till later. So if, you're, if you are worried about having the highest levels of calcium in your soil, this is a good one to go ahead and put in there. It's fast acting. And then of course, Magical is another option. Magical is a great one. Um, it not only will help with your pH, it'll, it'll correct your pH, but it'll also add a lot of calcium because this is a calcium derived um, uh, pH um, uh, changing uh, in your soil. So this is a, a great option. Uh, I definitely recommend doing this before planting, during planting, after planting, anytime. It is fast acting, so it'll get you a nice calcium source in there right away. And then of course, there's the liquid too. So we've got our yield booster. So this is even faster. So if you've got issues and they're starting to form, you can spray this on there. Um, and this gets calcium right into the leaves of the plant um, and into the root system and it is very, very quick acting. Uh, so yield boosters are a good one. You can see that black spot. If you've ever seen that on your tomatoes or peppers, that is the, uh, that is the, the issue that, that you are, that you are uh, confronting. It's called blossom and rot. Um, and so this is a very good option. Yield booster as well is a little bit faster. Um, now, if you've got blossoms and you're saying, oh, my tomatoes are blooming and my cucumbers are blooming, but they're not setting any fruit, all the blooms are falling off. Well, one option is, is you probably need some pollinators. So we need to, uh, we need to recommend uh, you know, planting some plants, like you can see some of the plants around me, like zinnias are a great option. Uh, lantana is a great option uh, to help encourage some of our uh, pollinators into the area. Even using a hummingbird feeder or a hanging basket um, nearby. Bee houses like this mason bee house. Now, these are not carpenter bees, but mason bees are a great pollinator. So this is a great option of something to put in your vegetable garden to encourage your pollinators into the area. Um, so pollination will help with losing your blooms, but if they're just not holding on, you can use a tomato and pepper set spray. So tomato and pepper set spray will help hold on to those blooms a little bit longer and allow your pollinators to get to work. So that, that could be an issue there. Um, now, if you're not getting enough blooms, that could be another concern. Um, maybe you just don't have enough phosphorus. So this is blooming and rooting, which is a great option. So blooming and rooting is a liquid. It's going to be very quick acting. And if you see those three numbers, this one is a 958.8. So that's very high in phosphorus, but it's a liquid form. So it's going to go through the soil a little bit quicker. It's going to get used up pretty quickly. But as you can see, um, it's going to force blooms. And that whenever you're looking at your fertilizer numbers, uh, whenever you're looking at your plant foods and you see those three numbers, I always tell people the first one is nitrogen, that's upward growth. The second one is phosphorus, that's roots growth, that's downward growth, which creates more blooms. And then potassium is the last one, which is an all around protector. So up, down, all around. Um, and what this one's going to do is force blooms. So my peppers, my squash, my zucchinis, my tomatoes aren't blooming enough. This might be an option of getting some phosphorus in there real quick. Um, that will help kind of set some of those blooms, get some of those blooms going for you. So hopefully that helps as well. Um, and then of course, using some of our blooming plants in the area, if you don't have a lot of space, using a shepherd's hook with a hanging basket on is a great option. Putting a hummingbird feeder in the area might be a great option. Um, and that will attract our pollinators to the area as well. So if you're not getting a lot of good pollination, we need to uh, encourage those, those uh, butterflies and hummingbirds and bees into our garden. Um, and not be afraid of them and not be using insecticides that are going to kill them um, and being careful about when we spray and use our insecticides um, and so that's why again i love that be safe um, option really really safe really really easy to use great one again to be preventative rather than curative uh, great option um, to protect our pollinators um, so be careful about that um, a couple other things that i wanted to mention was of course i know probably a lot of us have issues with squirrels or rabbits or deer or any of those things uh, they are a nuisance and it's hard to manage and, and deal with those. Um, but uh, animal repellent is a great option. This is uh, hot pepper wax. So very, very safe. This is made by Bone Eye. Uh, very easy to use. Protects against the deers and the rabbits and the squirrels. They don't like the taste of capsaicin, that hot pepper. Um, so you can spray your plants with this. It won't get absorbed by the plant. It won't make your tomatoes spicy. Um, but you, do, you can wash it off. Very easy to use. So this is a great option as well uh, to, to kind of repel them off. 
Uh, we've got lots of different repellents. I carry lots of different ones. So this is Repel-X squirrel repellent. I've got a Repel-X deer and rabbit repellent. Uh, we carry lots of different ones because sometimes they'll get used to the smell of one because uh, they all use different types of oils or, or smells or fragrances. Um, we also carry the animal repellent by I Must Garden. So another great option for a granular form that you can sprinkle around the garden. Um, so this is a really good option as well. Um, but animal repellent is a very, very good one. Um, to kind of keep the animals at bay and you can create kind of a barrier with them. You can sprinkle around the plants and it's going to last a little bit longer. Where some of your liquids you're going to want to use, um, every time we have a heavy rain, you're going to have to reapply. Um, but this one can last up to a month um, around in the soil. So great option there as well. Um, but those, those um, you know, pesky uh, squirrels and rabbits and deer can be an issue. And of course, there's birds as well. And there is bird netting. Uh, bird netting is an option. You can put this over top of your plants. But I'm sure, as you know, tomatoes and, and, and peppers and some of these plants, when they start to grow, they grow. And if it grows through this net, uh, you've got a, another problem on your hands. Um, so netting them is difficult. Uh, it works great for berries and stuff like that and fruit trees, uh, but a little bit harder in the vegetable garden to kind of keep those out. And that's why I like some of my repellents, um, just because it's an easy way to kind of manage that issue. Um, so, so those are some of the, the other small things that we have going on. Um, so that's kind of a quick rundown on everything. I know there's so much more that I could probably share with you on diseases and insects, and there's a lot, a lot of questions I know. So I'm going to try and get to all your questions now, um, uh, and, and, and kind of go through those because there's going to be a lot of topics that are going to pop up during that. So I hope if you want to stick around for that, but that's kind of the basics is be safe, be preventative rather than curative. Um, do some of the, those tips that I mentioned at the beginning. I really think that is super beneficial um, to kind of help be preventative. Do the things that you can do um, to help prevent some of our disease and insect issues. Inspect the garden. Mulch. Fertilize properly. Water properly. Water the roots, not the leaves. Um, you know, prune up our plants. Create good airflow. Um, and just enjoy the garden in general. Um, you know, don't, don't get stressed out. If you have any issues, we're here to help. We're here to, we're, we're ready for you and we're here to be contacted. I've got plenty of these solutions uh, for you if you need them. Um, you can do a little bit of research on your own or bring it into us and, and we uh, will we'll identify it for you or do some research and make sure we get it uh, fixed up for you right. Um, and hopefully everything turns out well for you. It's a great time to be in the garden. Uh, gardening is so much fun and the vegetables, uh, are just a great beneficial thing that you can do for yourself and your family um, and your loved ones. And it's a great time to be in the garden and enjoy it. So I hope you enjoy it. I hope you, you are successful. I hope some of the things that you learned today will make you successful because um, there's a lot of different things in there um, that you can use. Uh, but I know you've got lots of questions. So I really wanted to, to kind of breeze through that somewhat um, and, and kind of get to some of your questions um, so that, that we can answer some specific questions now. Um, so thanks again for joining. If you don't want to stick around for the, the question and answer period, then thanks for joining. If you do, I'm going to go ahead and get started because I know we got a lot of questions over here. All right, let me scroll back up to the top here where everybody was saying hello. All right. All right, so Tony said, uh, don't container vegetables dry out quicker? Yes, they do. Uh, they certainly do. Um, anything above the ground is going to dry out a little bit faster. Um, so you definitely are going to want to water a little bit more. So in containers or even raised beds, great point, um, uh, that, that those are going to dry out a little bit faster. Um, so you're going to have to water a little bit more. Again, kind of watching the plants. Um, a lot of them will tell you, peppers, cucumbers, squash, Tomatoes, they'll pretty much all kind of wilt on you a little bit, and when they do, then that's when you want to give them a good dose of water. Now, in a container, it's easy because you can kind of pick it up, and you can feel the weight of it, um, or you can use your finger, great tool right here, uh, to check the soil and see what, uh, and see what the, the moisture level is in there. If they're wilting, wilting doesn't always mean that they are dry. If they're wilting and the soil is wet, that means you really need to let them dry out because you could be causing a root rot issue there. Um, so great question there. Containers are definitely going to dry out faster. They're above ground. They're heating out faster. You've got more wind that are affecting the, the, the consistency of the moisture. Mulching your containers does help keep some of that consistent moisture in there as well, though, um, and keep some of the soil from splashing. So Emily said, uh, spray that plant killer around your plants. Um, so yes, you, you can. I'm not quite sure on what that was referenced to, but um, 
but yeah, you can spray it right around your plants if you want to. If you don't want to spray it on your plants, that will help some of those insects that are crawling up. Um, uh, let's see, somebody said, how about river rocks around the plants? Um, rocks are okay. It, it's, not, it's not bad. It's um, not the best weed preventer. Um, and it's not really going to keep your, your um, root systems cool or warm. Um, it's not the best at, at maintaining um, a consistent moisture level or consistent soil temperature. Uh, but it's not a bad one either. So if, if you're using river rocks, that's fine. Uh, definitely in the landscape, completely fine. Um, I always tell people if you're using rock for in the landscape to use weed fabric, rock is heavier than soil. So rock is going to sink and your soil is going to come up. So use weed fabric to prevent that from occurring. Uh, but rock is fine. But definitely a natural uh, mulch is going to be a little bit better for a vegetable garden purpose. So pine straw, cedar mulch, hardwood mulches, any of those mulches um, are going to be a much better option because they'll naturally biodegrade and, and work into your soil as well. Um, so those would be better options than, than the rock typically for your vegetable garden. Um, so Evelyn said, so would you put mulch all around the plants and the pass in between? Um, you definitely want to put them around the plants. That's probably the most important thing, Evelyn, is getting them around the plants to protect the soil from splashing. Keep that soil consistent in temperature and moisture level. Um, and then, of course, if you want to do it in the pathways, that's fine. Um, if that's something that, that you want to do for looks, you can. You don't have to. Um, I encourage it because wherever there's exposed dirt, something's going to eventually grow. Um, and so when you start to get weeds growing in your pass um, or grass growing in your pass, then that can spread into your vegetable garden um, and you've got uh, the, the bigger issues. Um, and then so, uh, so hopefully that helps you. I, I would mulch them personally. You don't have to. Uh, you just want to try and keep the, the temperature and the moisture consistency around the same around each plant. So by doing a good two to three foot section circle around each plant is going to be recommended. Um, and then Wilberta asked about the ladybugs. I, I answered that question. We should have them very soon, hopefully by the end of the week. Um, they did have a little bit of an issue with their, their supply of ladybugs um, in past weeks, so we should be getting more. Um, so Catherine said, I've seen tiny red bugs. So could be the start of some smaller um, insects. Um, there, there's a lot of different uh, tiny red bugs out there. Um, again, you, you've caught them. So Catherine, great. You, you've seen that you have an issue. I would attack them with either the triple action or the bee safe because they're small and they're tiny. They're probably going, they're probably at the nip stage. So they're probably a smaller cycle, uh, they're a, a younger cycle of another insect um, that could cause damage. Could be just a, a natural, you know, uh, insect that's in the garden. Uh, you know, if you want to, if you can capture some and bring some in, we can identify or take a picture, send us a picture. We can try and identify what it could be. Um, but it's a great option to go out there and go ahead and spray and cure that issue right away with something safe like our Be Safe um, or our Triple Action would be gonna, another good one. Um, so then Liz said, uh, should fungicides be used better in the evening? Say because of the sun for maximum effectiveness. Um, so I, I did mention that kind of earlier, but just to kind of confirm that, Liz, um, you can spray fungicides in the evening or in the afternoon. Um, it doesn't really matter. I, I do prefer them in the morning because you typically want fungicides to dry on the leaves. Um, and, you, and again, it's a moisture and you don't want the moisture sitting on there, even though it's to, to help and control fungus issues. We still, I, I'm, what I want to encourage is always trying not to have your plants be wet going into the nighttime. Um, so fungicides, insecticides, anything that you're spraying on the leaves of the plants, try and do it in the morning. It's a better practice. If you have to do it in the evening, it's fine. Um, it's just a better practice to try and do them in the morning if you can. What do you use for squash bugs? I talked about squash bugs. So Lillian, I hope you caught that. Um, squash bugs are tough. Um, again, there's lots of things that will actually kill them. Uh, but the hardest thing I think is that they, they, that they move pretty quickly. Um, they, they, uh, they, they, have a, 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 they lay a lot of eggs. They're hard to, to find. They're on the undersides of leaves. So you definitely need to turn over the undersides of your leaves. Lots and lots of different options to kill them. I do love my trick of getting the adults early as you possibly can. So right now is a great time to go out there. Put your board down. If you've had squash bugs in the past, put a board down. See if you catch any in the morning um, because they'll congregate under there. You can spray them or squash them. Um, and I mentioned some of the sprays, Spinosad, Spinosad, Soap. Um, or just the regular concentrate is a great option to kill them as well organically. Um, and then Joyce said, I've just had to spray for caterpillars. I use a product they have with BT enzyme. It's a spray. Yep, 
So BT is a great option for that. Again, it's that biological, completely safe. It only affects worms. Um, so it's going to kill uh, the, the uh, larva stage of a lot of our beetles and moths and stuff like that. Um, so BT is a great option. Uh, very specific, but a great option. Uh, Vivian said, I've been planting and experimenting on beets, corn, sage, basil, flowers, chives, garlic, berries, some leafy plants, peppers, trees, and some other stuff for the past two plus weeks. Anyone here plants some of the above? And do you have some tips? Um, so all of those are great options. Really pretty easy. I mean, check out some of, of, of my videos in the past. You can go to our website at mcdonaldgardencenter.com, Vivian. Um, or you can go to our Facebook page uh, that, that obviously you're on now, um, and you can check out all of our past videos that I've done. Um, I've done some on herbs, so if you want to check out, and, and it, that'll probably answer some of your questions on sage and basil. Um, I've talked about different types of annuals and chives and garlic and berries. I did a whole video on, on fruits and berries, um, so lots and lots of options out there for you to kind of get some advice. Uh, and then, Dan, if you ever experience any problems and you want to reach out to us, please feel free to. Um, ask us some questions. Uh, give us a call if you'd like to. I think Vivian, you might have been in a, in a different part of the country, so um, so that's probably why you're not stopping by. But um, but but hopefully that helps answer some of your questions. There's lots and lots of information out there. Uh, my tip on 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 the the herbs because you have a lot of herbs there is use them or lose them. They like to be cut, so cut on them, use them, um, and enjoy them. Um, and that will help them kind of reflourish and keep and keep leafing out for you because that's what we're using is the leaves. Um, do you have an opinion about self-watering containers? Um, yeah, I didn't mention um, earth boxes or self-watering containers. Um, those are great options to kind of help with uh, your water uh, capacity. Um, there's no problems with them typically. I mean, the idea behind a water, a self-watering container is the water gets stored in a, in a basin down underneath the plant and gets wicked up through the soil um, as that soil dries out. So as soil dries out, it'll find the water, it'll suck it back up into the soil. And that kind of is nice for containers because it keeps your fertilizer in there. Um, whereas a normal container with just holes in the bottom, the fertilizer is gonna flush out the bottom eventually over time. Again, why I always like granular fertilizers is because it's gonna stay in the container for a longer period of time um, and, and it's not gonna flush out as quickly. Uh, but that's a great option is, is self-watering containers. There's a lot of good ones. I've shown Earthbox before when we talked about uh, vegetable gardening in general. Um, and, and Earthboxes are a great option. Self-watering containers are amazing um, and, and those work as well. Um, what you just, the, the biggest issue that you could have ever occur is if there's too much water or sits down there for too long and isn't getting pulled up into the soil, that water can be kind of become mildewy or fungusy and, and get kind of nasty. So think of a swamp. You know, if, if your water becomes kind of swampy smelling, then you definitely are going to want to be able to empty that out. So making sure that it's got an overflow hole where you can empty out that water if it's been sitting in there a long time and refill it um, is one option. And then Mallory, you also asked, I think that I may overwater because I forget that the planter is supposed to be self-watering. And that, that is a very good possibility. Um, and again, what Mallory, I mentioned earlier, um, if your plant is wilting and the soil is moist, let it get to a dry point. Let it kind of re, re, uh, uh, be um, corrected from that. Um, so Mallory, you know, my, my advice for you would be use your finger. It's the best tool you got. If that soil is moist, don't water it. Let it get to a drier period. Um, before you water again. And, and I'm not saying to go as, as drastic as a wet dry cycle, let it completely dry out, um, but making sure that that water basin is being used up before you water again. And, and self-watering containers are typically going to be a little bit moist down the bottom and a little bit drier on the top. So using that weight thing is, is good as well. If it's a container that you can kind of feel the weight on, um, I definitely recommend that on our earth boxes. You know, just lifting up the earth box. If it's still pretty heavy, we don't need to water. Um, and so that's a great option as well there. Um, so hopefully that helped you, Mallory. Um, so Nemo said, can anthranose uh, be treated systematically uh, or si maybe systemically? Um, yes and no. Um, yes, it can be, um, but systemic fungicides aren't typically recommended for fruits and vegetables um, because uh, it goes into the system of the plant and therefore it goes into your fruit. Um, so unfortunately, uh, with, with anthranose, Anthracnose, I always have a hard time pronouncing that one, um, is it's typically spread by insects. Um, so again, kind of controlling the insect issue is going to be the best option there for that one. Um, but it can be soil-borne. 
Um, it, can, it can blow through the air. It, it, it's, it's a problem, and it usually affects tomatoes. You're going to see those sunken lesions on the leaves, um, and you'll actually see it eventually occur on the bark as well or on the trunk and the branching. Um, but it, it is a major disease, and unfortunately, we're probably always going to tell you to um, dispose of that plant. Uh, because there is no necessarily real cure for it. Now, there are varieties of tomatoes and cucumbers and squash that are uh, resistant to those. And there's a lot of those out there, so it brings up another good point. Um, if you've ever experienced major diseases um, like blight or, or bacterial spots, there's a lot of uh, uh, varieties out there now that are supposed to be pretty resistant to those. So kind of doing a little bit of research on those as well. Um, will help you kind of pick the right tomato plants or cucumbers or squash or zucchini uh, for your for your for your, um, um, for your garden. Butternut squash. I mean, a, a lot of people always ask questions about squash bugs, um, and I see another one coming up. Um, so so butternut squash don't get affected by squash bugs typically. Um, now typically, again, nothing is ever 100%. Uh, but but some of those varieties are are designed to to kind of uh, resist insects or disease issues. Um, so you can look at those as well. Um, so Noel said, after all the rain last week, I noticed that the leaves on one of my tomato plants has brown spots and were starting to curl up. Could that be due to too much water? Should I prune off those branches? Um, so yes and yes, it, it probably is too much water. Um, now, as long as your soil is drying out pretty well, um, and with all the rain that we've had in the area, we shouldn't really be watering our vegetable gardens right now, um, unless we're in containers or raised beds that are drying out a little bit faster. But if you're doing it in the ground, we probably aren't watering much right now. Um, now we're getting a little bit warmth today, but there's some rain in the forecast. So if you can push it, let those plants be pushed. Most likely water. Um, could be soil splashing up on it. So if you haven't mulched Noel, definitely mulch. Um, but pruning off those lower branches is a good idea. Now, it could be an early blight setting in. Um, so we want to disinfect our pruners for sure after each cut, before each cut, after each cut. Um, disinfect our pruners, but definitely limb up those bottom branches. If you start to see it spreading upwards, um, then it's most likely um, a bacterial leaf spot or an early blight. Um, and uh, those are curable, which is good, uh, with that broad spectrum or that copper soap. So we've got two great options for you to come in. And if you're seeing those issues, Noel, um, the copper soap is an organic one in the broad spectrum. Um, we'll take care of that because that's most likely what you're seeing right now. Um, and again, uh, the earlier that you kind of detect it and you can get a spray on it, the better off you'll be. Um, and typically what happens when uh, those, those blights occur on those bottom branches and they start to work their way up, uh, which can also be bacterial leaf spot, happens in the same manner. Typically won't kill the plant, but it certainly will affect your fruit set. Um, and, it, and it makes the plant look bad and it's hurting the leaves and it's a stressed out plant. And when stressed out plants, you get more issues. Um, so we, we can cure that. You'll probably need to prune off a lot of those branches, but we can cure it. And we just need to get a spray on it most likely. Uh, Carolyn, uh, you asked about squash bugs. I've, I've mentioned those a couple times. So if you missed it, rewind and watch this when we're done because um, I mentioned squat, well, squash bugs quite a few times. But tip, put the board down, spray them, squash them. I really think that helps. Uh, any tips for white flies? So Vivian said white flies. White flies can be a problem. They're, they really do a great job of spreading disease, unfortunately. Uh, but white flies, and they're hard because typically when you get near the bushes, they kind of fly away. Um, and then they kind of congregate back in there. But again, really all of your um, organic insecticides work. The sp spinosad is a great one. Uh, the Be Safe 3-in-1 is another good option. Really any or organic insecticide is going to work. The best thing to do is just get out there and spray in the morning. Um, and stand back. I love hose-in sprayers like this because I can stand kind of far, far back, not disrupt them and not have them fly away real quick and just kind of get a good spray over the top of everything real quick before they can kind of really get moving. Um, so, so hopefully that helps you with your white fly issue. Um, and then can you use the two recommended sprays when you have chickens and ducks that roam the garden? Um, that is a great question. Um, I would definitely read the uh, pack, uh, read the labels um, on all of your products before you spray. Uh, that is something off the top of my head that I might not know, um, and I'm not sure exactly the, the two recommended sprays that you're asking about. I, I would guess it's probably the ones that I keep talking about, which are Triple Action and the Be Safe. The Be Safe definitely um, you should be fine with, and, and the Triple Action you really should be fine with too. Um, uh, so, but again, reading the labels will help you know the Be Safe is Omri listed. It's very safe. It's sesame oil, fish oil, 
Um, and so it's not it's not going to have anything majorly. Um, um, there, there's no insecticides in there. There's no man-made products in there. So it's all organic, completely safe. And so is triple action for that for that matter. Um, but uh, do always read your labels. That is the best advice I can give anybody. Whenever you buy something, read the labels just so you know, because everything has different recommendations too. Uh, some of them you can spray right up to the day of harvest. Some of them you got to wait three to five days to harvest. Uh, so you always kind of want to know those about your different sprays um, and always having a little bit of a chart going. I always have a calendar on my outside fridge so I can say, okay, I sprayed this this day, so I need to wait 10 days. Or we've always got our great device in our hands. Plug it in there. I sprayed today, so you can always go back. Um, and say, you know, I know triple action is every seven to 10 days you can spray. Um, so I can put spray triple action on my garden and my phone. And then that way I know, okay, I can go back and look at it later. Um, or I know that I can spray again 10 days later. Um, so then... So Lorianne said... Michelle said, I use diatomaceous earth for aphids. Any other suggestions? I am seeing some mummies. I believe that is a good sign that I have a, paras uh, a parasitic wasp. Um, so yes, uh, diatomaceous earth works pretty well for aphids. Um, you might consider the, uh, the bee safe as a good option. Um, aphids are small, typically, and the suffocation behind the bee safe might work a little bit better. The triple action would be a good option as well. Triple action is a great one for aphids because the pyrethrin uh, will kill them on contact, but also you've got the neem oil that will suffocate them. Um, and then if you're still having issues, then we can go with spinosad, which would be another great organic option. Um, the parasitic wasp uh, would be a slightly harsher uh, issue, and I'm not sure what that would be on. Um, so it depends on what type of plant it's on. Um, and that might be something that uh, if it's an ornamental that we can take care of with a systemic, if, it, if it's an ornamental that's not blooming. Um, but if it's in your vegetable plant, um, then, then we would need to be a little bit more careful and then we need to look at a couple different options. We might have to go um, with the man-made broad spectrum to kind of, uh, to kind of get a little bit of a, of, a, of a stronger control for that. Um, so hopefully that helps. Uh, some of the oils might help with the, with the plastic, uh, the parasitic wasp. Um, and then Lorianne said, what oils besides neem can be used? So I mentioned horticultural oil, which horticultural oil, this one's made by Natural Guard. This is canola oil. Now don't go use your canola oil. Make sure it's at the right, this is the right recommendation of the type of canola oil to use. Uh, we don't recommend petroleum oils anymore. Uh, petroleum oils are obviously man-made. Um, and, and really you got to watch out with your temperatures there with canola oils, the sesame oil, the fish oil, the neem oil. All of those oils are pretty safe, um, and as we get warmer and warmer, that's just where we got to be cautious with them. When we get into that 90, 95 degree range is where we got to be careful with those. Um, but uh, lots of different types of oil products out there, um, and they all work pretty well. They all work in the same mannerism. They all are to suffocate. They're all to, to coat the leaves, suffocate the insect diseases out. Whoop, that was a little too far there, sorry. Uh, so Linda said, river rock and no nutrients to the soil while pine straw, wood chips, compost. So, so Linda, I think might have been answering um, my question there on the, on the river rocks uh, or the question from earlier. Um, definitely, you know, any kind of organic mulch is going to be better than um, the rock necessarily. I mean, the rock actually will very slowly, <laughs> very, very slowly erode um, um, by rain and stuff like that um, and rubbing against each other. Um, and release minerals, which are good. Um, but it's an extremely slow process and you're gonna add a lot more organic matter by using uh, wood chips or compost or the pine straw uh, really will help much better. Will banana leaves be a good mulch? Um, Lorian, so yes, um, they can. I definitely would age them. I would compost them in a pile. We're gonna be doing a compost seminar, Lorian, um, in a couple weeks. So you might wanna check into that. Um, to get a compost pile started. They can, you can use compost at different levels, um, but we want to kind of get those a, a little bit more biodegraded. What you don't want a banana leaf to do, I mean, you obviously need to shred them, cut them up very good. Then I think you're probably okay to use them. But in the early stages of composting, um, there's a lot of nitrogen um, uh, usage to break down, um, to break down uh, organic matter like banana leaves or any other vegetation. And so when you're using, when, it, when, a, when the soil or, or the environment is using nitrogen, 
to, to, to decompose things, it's pulling it away from the plants. So, um, so like grass clippings are okay. You want to make sure your grass clippings obviously haven't been treated with anything. Um, and make sure your banana leaves. So that's kind of the other thing. We'll, we'll get into that. That's a big, bigger discussion on composting that we'll talk about um, in a couple of weeks when we do that seminar. Um, so I definitely would check into that one, Lorianne. Um, but if you shred them up and you've used them before and you've been successful, great. Banana leaves are thick um, and, the, and they're durable. Um, and so they probably last a long time, but you probably want to decompose them to a certain level before you use them as a mulch. Um, do you suggest the use of diatomaceous earth? Carolyn said, yes, definitely. Love diatomaceous earth. Really, really easy product to use. You know, I like this little puffer tube. You can just sprinkle it around. You can put it on plants. You can put it around plants. Anything that crawls across it will get sliced up um, and, and, and eventually die, unfortunately for them. But uh, it does really, really help. It's a very, very safe product to use. Uh, actually, a great product to use around the home as well. Um, so uh, Vivian said, I saw many people use soap, alcohol, water, and some other liquids for pests. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of home remedies. I didn't talk about home remedies. Not my favorite things to suggest, Vivian, um, just because I uh, don't know how effective they are. Um, I don't use a lot of home remedies myself. I don't recommend a lot of them. I've got proven solutions that we definitely are going to recommend for this area um, and, for, and for across the country, really. Fertilome's a national brand. You can get them at a lot of your locally owned garden centers. Um, so if you're in a different area um, and you need to get some of these products that I've mentioned here, uh, that might be a good option. Um, but uh, yeah, you can use uh, soap and alcohol and water, and there's a lot of different ones out there. But you got to be very, very careful about what types you're using. Um, and the concentration that you're using in the mixing ratios. Um, and again, just not a lot of proven results out there. And if you ever go, like I mentioned to some of your educational websites, uh, you know, the, the horticultural colleges, and you're looking at their information, they're almost always going to recommend one of the products that I mentioned here today um, uh, because they're going to be the best option. They have proven results that we know are going to work pretty well. Um, and then Vivian asked, does anyone may have here make their own compost? Um, Vivian, I hope you tune in in a couple of weeks. I'll be talking about how to make your own compost uh, very soon. It's, it's a longer topic that I really want to get into right now, but it can be, very, it can be done very simply. So I don't want to scare you either. Um, it's a very simple process. Uh, Jana said, can you spell spinosad? Um, great question. Um, it's actually S-P-I-N-O-S-A-D. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, but spinosad, spinosad, a lot of people pronounce it differently. That's fine. Um, but that'll get you pretty close the way you spelled it. But it's S-P-I-N-O-S-A-D, spinosad, spinosad. Uh, what about vine borers? So vine borers are a tough one, Kathy. Uh, they, they typically are coming um, uh, from the ground. So diatomaceous earth will help. Um, uh, the, those eggs get laid in there and they hatch and they, and they bore into the vines. And unfortunately, there's not a lot that you can do about it. Um, the, the best thing, again, is, is starting early and being preventative to prevent them from occurring. Uh, because once they're in there, uh, there's not a whole lot you can do because we can't use systemics. Uh, and once they're in the plant, it's very difficult to get them out and to, and to cure that issue. Um, so, so Kathy, unfortunately, they're not an easy one. Um, the spinosad is your best bet. Um, this one's great for uh, leaf miners and bagworms and borers. Um, so spinosad is probably your best option to try and try and use this early. And, and this is one of my other kind of pre favorite preventatives um, is spinosad um, because it does control so many insects and so many of the ones that get on our favorite crops like tomatoes and cucumbers and squash. Um, and so this would be a great option for you, Kathy, to try um, and get on it kind of early because if you've dealt with it in the past or if you're dealing with it already, it's a good thing to get out there and start spraying and this is a good option for you. Um, and then let's see, can you provide links to all of these items or recipes for homemade? Uh, so Vivian, I don't have any recipes for homemade, um, uh, so, but I know you can find some online if you want to try them. I would always say test it on a smaller portion of your plant. Um, before you go and spray every single plant um, and, and because, because they're just not proven and tested. All of the products here that I, that I talked about really are made by uh, Fertilome. Fertilome, great company. Uh, they make all of our natural guard products. They also make, I don't know if I showed, oh yeah, so like the calcium nitrate is high yield. High yield, Fertilome, and natural guard. Let me pull up my natural guard here just so you can see. Natural guard are all made by Fertilone. So if you go to their website, 
great resource, uh, Vivian, and, um, and, and hopefully they, they can help you kind of direct you and, and they're great customer service. So you can call them if you've got questions um, and they would know in your area if they're selling any of their products in your area so they could tell you where to pick those up. Um, and then let's see, so Talon said, how about ticks? They have been a huge problem in our garden this year, but we need to be careful since we have chickens, ducks, and guineas. Um, so yeah, ticks are a, a problem, um, and they are not easy to control, um, unfortunately. Um, so I didn't show this product, which is ant killer granulars. Um, again, man-made, so it's not completely um, the, the, the best uh, option for you because you have so many um, uh, wild, you know, or you've got you've got your chickens and ducks um, in the area. Um, but what this is is again, it's it's a long residual. Um, it's the best for ticks um, in the yard, um, and because it's got such a high residual, it's going to last such a long time. Now, this is safe to use around vegetables and edibles, so you can use it around there. I would need to read the precautions on it. So, um, Talon, I might get back to you on on what might be the safest option for you um, to to help. Uh, I don't know if cedar would help. Maybe using cedar as a mulch might. Uh, cedar has those natural oils that help repel insects, but I'm not sure if that works on ticks. So I'd have to check into that. Um, ticks are a problem. Uh, they've been a problem in my yard for sure this year, um, and they're going to be a problem because we had a very mild winter. When we have mild winters, they're going to come back out in a, in a force in the next year. Um, and of course, they spread disease and stuff like that. So, so ticks can become a major problem, and you want to keep them off your chickens and ducks and your other wildlife that you have, but you got to get rid of them um, so that you can work in the garden and you can have your, your um, other animals out there. Um, so let me, let me do a little bit of research for you, and I'll get back to you on that one um, and see if there, there's an organic solution or something safer that you can use for ticks um, and not uh, be harmful to your chickens and ducks. Um, so what about potato beetles? So potato beetles... Um, are, are an issue as well. Um, again, um, you can use the diatomaceous earth because they're typically crawling around. Uh, the spinosad, the spinosad works pretty well on those as well, the potato beetles. So that's a good option for you. And then of course the triple action, which is another safe one, uh, would work as well for your potato beetles. Um, so getting a little bit stronger. If we want to get super, super strong, then that's where I would go to the broad spectrum um, insecticide, which is that bifenthrin based again. Uh, but potato beetles can become a problem if you're growing potatoes in this area. Um, they definitely have been a nuisance before. Um, so hopefully any of those products really should work pretty well for you. Again, getting them early before they can reproduce and become a major nuisance is the best option, Joyce. Um, so Jocelyn Harris said, Spinal Am Amazon has the bottle. He showed ready to ship at the end of May. Great. So good. If you can't come in here and you got to use Amazon, that's great. Maybe you're from another area. Uh, but obviously, if you're in the Hampton Roads area, uh, we would want you to support your local businesses and, and shop with us. Uh, Evelyn said, wants to or was to get rid of ants. Uh, or what do I have to get rid of ants? So, of course, the ant killer granulars. Um, but again, that's a, a little bit more of a, of a stronger um, option for you. Um, I do have, I don't think this one works great on ants. Let me see if it says ants on it. Um, so this is, I didn't show this one. This is blood bug, slug, and snail bait. Um, and it does have a picture of an ant, but basically it's iron phosphate and then spinosad again. The iron phosphate is what's gonna kill the slugs and the snails, but the spinosad is a great one because it's in a granular form. So this you can shake around your plants and then as sp the spinosad, spinosad, um, that's, in the, that's in this granular, as those bugs and those ants crawl across it, this'll work. So this is a good one for ants um, and it's completely safe and organic. Uh, please make a resource list, said Evelyn. Um, yes, our notes from this class will be out at the end of, of this class or as soon as we can get them kind of uh, published and get them out there. Um, again, I kind of, this is a, it's a very difficult one to do because there's so many different disease and insect issues and, and the resources are, are um, uh, a very long. <laughs> and so, again, that's why we have partnered with Fertilome, love this company. They have great resources on their website. Check them out, they're awesome. Um, and, and, and if you can't get their products, it at least will show you the, the active ingredient and then you can find that in a lot of different sources as well. Um, but Fertilome has great resources on this. You can type in anything into their search engine. It's very difficult for us to kind of maintain that. Um, and that's why we're doing these videos. And that's why we have our Facebook page and we can reach and you can reach out to, out to us um, if you have any issues. 
Um, so hopefully that helps you. Uh, Vivian said, any tips for different climates? Um, I don't know different climates as well as the, the one that we're in, obviously. Um, but um, if you have high humidity, which a lot of us do, lots of humidity, um, hot summers, that's typically where we're going to experience a majority of our problems. So you can get them early, you can get them late, but you can get them in the middle as well. So it's, again, just kind of early detection um, and making sure that you're on top of it um, so that you can kind of identify what those issues might be and you get on top of them as soon as possible. And again, being preventative rather than curative. Um, Jana said, will fungicide sprays work on moss on a plum tree trunk? Um, no, uh, moss is actually um, uh, um, is not necessarily a, a fungus. Um, it's more of a, of a plant. Uh, so will fungicide sprays work on moss on, on a plum tree trunk? Um, no, and if you've, if you've got, uh, what you really need is almost like an algicide. Um, so is, if it's moss Janus, um, you probably can scrape it off pretty easily and be very gentle with it and not hurt the, the trunk of your plum tree. Um, we do have a moss killer. I would need to kind of make sure that that would actually work on, um, on spraying onto a trunk. I can't imagine it would, but that means that the moss has, has rooted in somewhat into that trunk. So we don't want to spray it with a moss killer and then inject that into your plum tree. Um, so we want to be careful about that. If it's lichen, which a lot of people think is a moss, um, lichen is usually on the shady side of a tree. It's kind of a grayish color. Um, um, and so that is, is, is another thing that, that can get on the trunks of trees. You see it a lot in the wild. You see it a lot on our azaleas. Um, it is something that you can actually spray for. We have a couple different sprays that you can use for lichen. Um, although typically, again, it's not going to cause any major issues. So unless you see an issue with your plum tree, um, then, then we might need to work on that. Um, but uh, that would be a good one to kind of bring in a picture or send us a picture and let us see if we can answer that question. Uh, so this is replying to Vivian, uh, said, I have a red warm bin that I have kept for 12 years. I keep it in my back hall. No smells. If you know what to give them, I keep a pail under the sink for a weekly trip out to my compost pile in the backyard. So great. Um, so she's got, so Linda's got some great advice there on, on composting. Um, and we'll talk about that again in my seminar that we'll be doing in a couple weeks. So tune in for that. Uh, Missy said, should I mulch citrus and berry plants like lemon, figs, black, blue, black, raspberries, and loquats? I recommend mulching any plant, any shrub, tree, perennial, annual, fruit, berry, uh, vegetable, everything. I always recommend mulching. It's going to keep weeds out. It's going to keep your moisture uh, level consistent. It's going to keep your temperature consistent. It's only a good thing. It's going to naturally biodegrade and turn into a compost and add organic matter. So there's nothing but good benefits that you can get from um, using mulch. So definitely mulch everything. I mulch things in containers. I mulch everything, raised beds. I mulch my, my, my landscape. Best thing you can do. Um, so at the end of the live, can you please post a list of all the products and items you use? Yes, that's a great option, Vivian. I will do that. Uh, I'll get a list um, to, uh, the, um, to, to our, our great person that uh, is taking notes for me um, and, and get a list of all of those things up for you so that you can at least see my favorites that I definitely recommend the majority of. Um, is there anything to deter, deter voles? Um, yes. So, Dale, great question. We have a great product made by Repelex. This is not it, but this is the brand, Repelex. We have a mole and vole repellent from Repelex. It's completely organic, completely safe. You can use it in your vegetable garden. Um, you can use it in your landscape, in your lawn, um, and it'll get rid of voles uh, very easily. So that's a great option. We have a systemic product. Obviously, you don't want to use that in your vegetables, but if you've got vole damage in your uh, hostas or your daylilies or any of your other uh, in-ground landscape ornamental plants, that is a great option as well to protect those from voles. But in our vegetable gardens, we got a repellent that'll get them out. Works great. Um, so Judy said a fake snake will help keep birds away. That's true. Uh, and I don't sell any more of the fake snakes or the owls with the rotating heads, uh, but those are great options. Uh, they really are. They, they do work. A lot of people use, uh, some of those shiny kind of, uh, reflectors or pieces of foil that move in the garden. That'll also kind of keep the birds and other things away that they don't like, um, uh, moving things real quick. Uh... Maybe Ann said, I'm 11 years and I love gardening and I have been planting veggies, etc. That's awesome. Judy, 
Uh, maybe near your fruit trees, they can be moved around easily to fool the birds. You can buy several from a dollar store. Great. Would you put BT or DE on broccoli to prevent worms? Um, yes, for sure. So when we're talking about broccoli or cabbages or kales or lettuces or spinaches or any of those leafy vegetables, although broccoli will head up, um, all of those leafy greens can get cabbage moss and BT is a great one. Diatomaceous earth works as well. Both of them, whether in the, so the dusting issue is the issue. So let me see if I can find. So I've got my dipel dust and I got my diatomaceous earth. The biggest downfall of dusting or of, of powders is every time it rains, you gotta apply again. So that's the only downfall of them, which is why I really love the BT and the liquid spray. So this is the Caterpillar Killer Sprayer with BT, uh, made by Natural Guard. Again, you can get this a lot of different ways. Uh, so you can get it in the powder or the liquid. But I like this just because after it rains, I can just go quickly spray them real quick. I don't have to worry about dusting them again. Um, but Caterpillar Sprayer is a great option. Um, especially when you're trying to keep it on the plants. It's much easier. It dries. Through a light rain, it'll last. Um, a heavy downpour, you'll have to reapply. So Steve said, are you available at any location for a brief discussion regarding another topic? Um, so yes, or, or maybe. Uh, Steve, reach out to me, or I'll reach out to you after the class and see if that's something you want to do. I typically am here at the Independence location all the time, um, working uh, most uh, Monday through Fridays. Um, I'm typically here, obviously, other than doing these seminars, um, I am most likely always here, but uh, I will reach out to you and see what that topic is, and uh, at least we can have a phone call if we need to. Uh, Michelle said, I have aphids pretty bad, and I have been using diatomaceous earth. I sent a picture to the Virginia Master Gardeners, and they mentioned I have mummies. Is this good? Does this mean I have, a par Does this mean I have parasitic wasps? Um, I would need to do a little bit of research into that, Michelle. Um, that, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I don't know a ton about parasitic wasps uh, off the top of my head. I would have to do a little bit of research. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what's occurring there. Um, so it, whatever you sent to the Virginia Master Gardeners, maybe if you can send that to me um, uh, or send that to our Facebook page, uh, we can look into that um, and see if we can do a little bit more research into that. Uh, might be something that you need to go to the, your extension agent um, to get a little bit more information on. Uh, aphids um, are generally pretty easy to control. Um, and and if, if, the, if the infestation gets really bad, we might need to use a little bit more of a, of a stronger control, a traditional control. Um, but Michelle, maybe that'll help. And, and maybe we can do a little bit more research after this is over and kind of go through what's going on there. Um, how do you get rid of moles in the garden? So we've got that great mole and vole repellent. Uh, I did a whole video on mole and voles. Uh, so definitely go check that out. It was a seminar about how to get rid of them in your lawn, your garden, everywhere. Um, so go check that out for the full uh, range of all the information. We've got lots of different products. But as I mentioned earlier, Repellex makes a great natural organic repellent that'll get them out of your garden. Uh, so Francis said, I have terrible aphids and I'm pulling out my light green lettuce today. I tried lace wings, but I can't see anything happening. They say to avoid insecticides, but they are so many and they're spreading to the tomato plants. Yeah, unfortunately, our, least, our, our leafy greens are coming to the end of their time anyways. So Francis, you might, uh, re uh, rec I might recommend pulling them out as well. Um, so taking those out will help control the insects in that area. Um, and then, um, again, if you've got aphids, pretty easy to take care of. Uh, like I said, kind of one of the strongest organic insecticides out there is spinosad. So great option. Um, and then, so Catherine said, thank you again for your helpful webinars and answering our questions. Your videos are helping us a lot. Good. I'm so glad. What is your opinion on grow bags? Um, so I used to carry them. I, I actually like them. The downfall of grow bags um, is, and I'm assuming you probably are meaning the fabric bags, that um, do a uh, root pruning. Uh, they're really, really cool. The science behind it is awesome. Um, I love it, uh, but um, a lot of people didn't understand it. They weren't huge sellers. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, I have to let the internet take some, some part of that. So the, the internet is a great resource to be able to get those. We carried Smart Pots, great brand, um, awesome product, uh, very, uh, very um, um, uh, economical. They're, they're, they're not very expensive. Um, and you can plant in them. The downfall is, or the, the benefit is it does root pruning, which means the air, the roots hit the sidewalls of these fabric pots, 
they dry off the roots, they kill the roots back a little bit, you get a root prune, which is actually a good thing, sounds bad, but it's actually a good thing, makes your, big, your plant bigger on the top. Um, the downfall is you're typically watering a little bit more. Um, and that's what I think a lot of people ran into when they tried them in this area, uh, especially when we got hot, is it, they dried up a lot, they were watering a lot, and, and that's where uh, the success rate started to go down. So the idea is great, they do work very well, they're very economical, um, I just don't carry them anymore. But that's my opinion is I would use them for sure. I love them. Um, I think they're great products and I think they're very versatile. You can do a lot of different things with them. Um, so Katie said, what kind of hose do you recommend for watering an organic garden? We just bought a new one and it smells of chlorine. Not sure if that will now contaminate the garden. Um, so Katie, um, you, you should, on any hose, it should say um, that, it, that it complies um, or it doesn't have anything that would contaminate your garden. Um, it should say drinking water um, or, or can be used with drinking water. So, uh, so that would be what I would look for um, is if you still have the package, check that out. Um, I have a, a couple different hoses that, that I love. Zero G is my favorite hose now because it's lightweight. It's extremely durable. Uh, it doesn't kink. It's just an awesome, awesome hose and it's completely safe for drinking water. Um, so Katie, check out your hose and make sure, uh, my guess is it's, it's the rubber. It's probably a rubber hose. Rubber hose have that kind of natural kind of, uh, kind of, uh, uh, smell to it. Um, and that'll work, that'll, that'll work its way out eventually. Um, if you're really concerned, you can, um, you can use watering cans if it's not too big of a garden. Watering cans, just fill up your watering can. And then if you can let it sit for 24 hours, then that'll naturally, um, uh, work the natural chlorine and uh, fluoride that are in our water anyways, our drinking water out um, over a 24 hour period and then you can use that. Or maybe consider getting a rain barrel for your garden. Would be a great option. But do check the labeling on your hose. I think that'll tell you um, if you're gonna have any issues. So Rue said, hi Mike, which of the two fungicides you showed us do you recommend as best to get rid of aphids? Um, so for aphids, you wanna use an insecticide, Ruth. Uh, you definitely, uh, Spinosad is one of my favorites. Triple action would be a great option. Neem oil, really there's lots of good ones for aphids. Um, but for fungicides, you definitely, those are for your fungus issues, your blights um, and, and your bacterial leaf spots and stuff like that that we might, that we might experience in this area. Uh, but for aphids, we definitely wanna use an insecticide. Uh, the Be Safe would work great. Uh, so I know the Be Safe is available at all of our market locations, as well as if you wanna go a little bit stronger, the triple action. So the triple action and the be safe, great options for your aphids. Uh, let's see. What about ants? Do I have to get rid of them? Not typically. Most likely the ants aren't causing any issues. Now you might have ants because you have another insect. Um, other insects that, that leave a sticky uh, residue, um, ants find attractive. And so ants might be warning you or telling you about some other issue that you might have. Um, ants don't typically do a lot of damage. Um, so Joyce is replying to you say they don't normally bother them. They can be good pollinators. That is true. So, um, so then they do can, they can work from flower to flower. Um, uh, but, um, if you're having a major ant issue and you feel like they're causing issues, uh, there might be another sign that there is something there. Um, and again, uh, Spinosad or, um, the bug slug and snail bait might be a good option if you want to get rid of them organically. Um, sorry, so, so Love said, sorry, late to the party, we're, uh, we're aggressive snails already discussed here. Snails are eating all my seedlings. Any help will be much appreciated. So bug, slug, and snail bait, completely organic, completely safe, granular, so easy to use. You just sprinkle this around the garden and the snails will get there. Snails and slugs typically hide underneath rocks and stones that you might have nearby, uh, planters, stuff like that. If you're growing everything in plants, they're probably under there. So sprinkle it around the top surface of the soil. At night, they're crawling in, they're crawling across the soil. This will kill them. Awesome product. I would use this. Or diatomaceous earth, which is another option for slugs and snails, the diatomaceous earth. So you got two good options there. Um, and then Joyce, you know, Joyce is, or is answering my questions, so good. Um, so pickle worms, my nemesis, anything in particular that helps control them. Uh, pickle worms I've never heard of. Um, now, now maybe that's a different name for something else um, that I might know off the top of my head, but um, if it's a worm, a caterpillar, um, that, that has become an issue, then of course the BT, the Bacillus thurgenis is gonna be the strongest because it attacks worms. 
Um, so this would be probably your best option um, is the Caterpillar sprayer uh, or the, the Caterpillar killer spray with BT is a great option. You can also do it in the powder form as well. Uh, but I don't know pickle worms off the top of my head. Again, I, probably another, that's probably a common name for another one that, I, that I'm not sure I quite know off the top of my head. Um, so Donna said, what do you think about spike vegetable fertilizers? Um, not my favorite, to be honest, Donna. Um, I recommend granular fertilizers uh, because you can get a much even spread and you get it all the way around the plant. So with the spike, if I show you here on this plant, I got the zinnia here. If we spike here and we spike over here and we spike over here, it's only feeding a small portion of that root system. And feeder roots on a plant are all around the top surface of the soil. Um, and so typically in the drip line. So if a plant like this is growing in the ground, then out here is where its feeder roots are. And that's where we want to fertilize. And so those spikes are very uh, nonspecific. They're not going to get uh, that, that whole area covered. And that's why I like granulars. They're easy to use. You just sprinkle them around. You don't have to worry about damaging the root system. Like I mentioned earlier, we don't want to hurt the root system. So, um, so definitely want to use a granular fertilizer. I don't recommend spikes. I don't sell them. If you have them, use them up. But, um, but definitely uh, try the, the uh, granular fertilizers. I think they're better. Um, so Del Reza said foam like stuff on plants, hard to say, could be scale, could be mealy bug. Um, if, if it's foam like stuff, uh, that might be a good one. If you want to send us a picture, um, there are some insects that will actually kind of have like spittle bugs. They put out like the spit looking stuff that looks like foamy spit. Um, but I doubt that's what it is. Um, most likely it's probably scale or mealy bug. Um, that looks like a little bit of like a white foam on your plants. Uh, so send us a picture if you want us to diagnose that specifically. Um, if, it, if you think it's an insect, if you smush it, I know this sounds gross, but if you smush it and there's blood inside, most likely an insect. Um, and so then you can get uh, something like the triple action or the spinosad soap that I was mentioning earlier. Vivian said, I love the plants in your background. Well, thank you. Yeah, we got gorgeous plants here. <laughs> Um, so thank you. Uh, so Talon said, thank you for following up with your six for me. It's been scary with detaching several per day off my kids. I know that it's tough. Um, I will definitely look into that and see if I can find the safest option for you. Uh, Stacy said, should I mulch the entire raised garden better just around the tomatoes, peppers, kale plants? I definitely recommend doing the whole bed if you can. Um, so if you can, if you can mulch off the whole raised bed, that's going to be the best option. Um, because uh, you're going to get, again, get that more consistent moisture uh, retention. You're going to get that more consistent um, uh, temperature um, range there as well. Look up tick tubes. They are more of a long-term solution. I believe you put them out in the fall. They can be purchased or you can make them. Uh, so yes, tick tubes I have looked at before. Um, that's a, that's a, that is a good option. Um, it does help. Um, I believe mice crawl through them that have the ticks on them and then it helps spread. Um, I believe it's something like that. Uh, don't quote me on that. Um, but tick tubes could be an option. Uh, I don't know if that's going to control the overall solution. It might be something where we need to, uh, to do a um, uh, stronger control. But I, like I said, Talon, I'll, I'll get back to you on that one for sure. Um, so Karen said, will, um, will diatomaceous earth hurt my chickens or my puppy's feet? No. Very soft to humans and other animals. It's just soft-bodied insects is the only thing that will hurt. So you don't have to worry about that either. Um, and Stacy said, great, thanks for the notes. Was just at McDonald's this morning. The staff in the pest control section is super helpful, awesome. Uh, Linda said, whack-a-mole. Uh, so let's see. So Karen said, send me uh, about the ticks around the animals also. I will, Karen. Thank you for that, that comment. Um, how to get rid of too much dust on leaves if water is no good for them. Um, so if you've got dust on your leaves, um, you can use just a regular wet uh, paper towel. Do it in the morning, not in the evening. Um, again, that way it will give your leaves uh, time to, to, to dry out before we go into the, the uh, dark period of the, of the nightfall and dampness and darkness cause fungus. Now inside plants, if you need to dust the leaves, you can really do that anytime. Um, again, just general practices, do it in the morning and not at night. Never water the leaves. If we need to dust them off, 
using a wet washcloth would be fine or a wet paper towel would be fine. Um, outside plants, the rainwater, it'll rain sometime, right? And the rain will wash off any kind of dust that you might have on your plants outside. Uh, Wilberta said, do you have rain barrels? I sure do. Um, I've got a, uh, a really nice um, a rain barrel that, that's got a, for a great cause, awesome. Um, they're, they're very easy to hook up, um, so you should definitely stop by. We only have them here at the Independence location. I don't think I have any more at the Great Neck location. I might, um, but yes, we do have rain barrels here at Wilbolta. Um, so, let's see. So we're going to say, uh, Evelyn, are you with me? So you're talking with somebody else. Okay, so Steve said, thank you, Mike. It's regarding a weeping cherry tree. Steve, I'll definitely get in touch with you um, and see if we can set up a time to talk about your weeping cherry tree. If you've got any issues there, we can figure out what it is. Um, and then I think everybody else is just kind of having some communication back and forth. So um, my screen went away, so I don't know if anybody's still watching. But hopefully uh, you all had a great time. Uh, this is one of the longest ones. I knew there was going to be lots of questions, so I tried to breeze through all the information. Uh, we'll get our notes out there. We'll be back Friday. Um, and so let's see, I got one more. Is it okay to remove bugs from fruit trees manually? Of course. Um, you can definitely remove any bugs manually by using your hands, um, by spraying it off with water. It is an option as well by a hard spray. Those are great um, organic and very safe options. Um, so hopefully that, that helps you, Evelyn. Uh, but again, thanks for joining. Uh, I knew there was going to be lots of questions, so I wanted to get to all of those. I hope you all got, got uh, good information from this. We have lots of solutions. Of course, every problem requires something different, um, but we did give you some, some, some basics um, on how to kind of maintain um, and, and kind of keep up with being preventative rather than curative. So uh, again, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this. Uh, have a great day. Enjoy this amazing weather. Um, and Vivian, thank you for joining in too and being such a great uh, communicator. Uh, Wilberta, have a great day. Everybody enjoy the rest of this amazing day. Uh, get out in the garden, relieve some stress, uh, have fun out there, and we'll see you soon. And we'll be back Friday for my top 10 perennials. Hope you can join us. Talk to you later. Bye.